Greetings, this is Greg. In the previous video, we discussed propeller basics and worked our way up to about 1908, so let's start there. Propellers at that point were fixed pitch, which means the blade angles didn't change, and in practical terms, that meant that they could only reach their maximum efficiency when the engine was at a specific power setting and the airplane at a specific airspeed. This wasn't really a problem at the time. Most pre-World War I airplanes had maximum speeds only a little bit faster than their stall speeds. In other words, they took off, climbed, cruised, and descended all within a very narrow speed range, typically about 25 miles per hour or so. So the propellers were never going to be that far off of their maximum efficiency numbers. During World War I, planes got a bit faster, but as a general rule, they're still operating within a relatively narrow speed range. A typical World War I fighter would stall at around 50 miles an hour and have a top speed of around 110 miles an hour. That's a wide enough range so that the designers in some cases optimize prop pitch for one specific segment of that range. As I've mentioned before, the Smithsonian Institute found that the Fokker DR-1 had a prop with relatively low pitch to optimize climb performance, which had the additional benefit of optimizing the plane's maximum sustained turn rate. In other words, a lot of the DR-1's famous dogfighting ability came from its propeller, not the triplane design. Specific prop data for World War I planes is tough to come by, but it appears to me that as a general rule, um, and believe me, I am painting with a very broad brush here, but as a general rule, the Germans were optimizing their props for climb and the British and French more for speed. Please understand I'm basing that statement on secondary source data. For example, I've read in uh, some pilot reports and books and stuff, and I've read it a number of times, that when the Albatross D3 came out, it could outturn any Allied plane except the Sopwith Pup. The D3 is also pretty slow for the amount of power it has and for its weight. Furthermore, it's easy to overspeed the prop in the D3 when you're in a dive. All of these things suggest to me that it had a relatively low pitch prop considering the power of the engine and the weight of the aircraft. Now there were experiments with variable pitch propellers up to and during World War I. Engineers understood why those might be desirable, but they didn't make it into production. The technology was new, it was unreliable, and it wasn't really needed, again due to the narrow speed ranges of the aircraft in use. And even if they could have got them to work perfectly, there would have been a cost in weight and complexity which would offset the increases in efficiency. In other words, World War I, the cost-benefit ratio probably wasn't there, even if they could have got uh, variable pitch propellers into action. Now, during World War I, nearly every aircraft uses a wooden propeller. In the case of rotary engine planes, like this Volker Eindecker, those engines were severely RPM limited because the entire engine spun on a stationary crankshaft. Now this was great for air cooling at low indicated air speeds at which the planes operated. In fact, that's why they did it that way. But the rotation created a lot of centrifugal force trying to pull the engine apart. Thus, rotary engines only spun up to about 1400 RPM, give or take a bit, which means that the propellers of the time, which were bolted directly to those rotary engines, only spun at about 1400 RPM. These early props were usually made of a multi-ply laminated wood construction and for the most part worked very well in those lower RPM, lower power applications. Although it should be said that the first fatal aircraft accident was caused by the failure of a wooden propeller. In 1908, Orville Wright was demonstrating his flyer to the U.S. Army at Fort Myer. The Army required him to take a passenger, specifically one Lieutenant Selfridge. Orville did not want to take him because he was well aware, and I don't see this mentioned very often, but it's, it's a fact, he was well aware that Selfridge was a member of the Aerial Experimental Association, or AEA, 
Now that was a well-funded association started by Alexander Graham Bell, and it was made up mostly of people trying to copy the rights. In fact, Selfridge had been working for Graham Bell for a while and had actually been in a, quote, aircraft, unquote, accident before. He was a passenger on one of Alexander Graham Bell's man-lifting kites when it crashed. That kite was called the Signet One. I don't have a picture of it, but here is Bell and his wife with another one of his, another one of his kites that I think was of a similar design, just smaller. Anyway, in terms of pictures, uh, that's the best I can do. Bell wrote to President Roosevelt, because Alexander Graham Bell had political influence, and so he wrote to, to Teddy Roosevelt to get Lieutenant Selfridge assigned to this duty, and Orville was well aware that Selfridge's goal was to get right secrets back to the AEA. Of course, Orville understood that he had to play the political game. Probably didn't like it, but he understood. So he took off with Selfridge in the passenger seat, and shortly after takeoff, at an altitude of less than 200 feet, thankfully in this case, a propeller came apart, and pieces of it badly damaged the tail of the Wright Flyer, rendering it uncontrollable. It plunged to the earth. Orville suffered serious injuries that would plague him for the rest of his life. Lieutenant Selfridge was fatally wounded. I think it's actually impressive, though, that the Wrights managed to fly in powered airplanes for five years, including teaching themselves to fly, before they had a fatality, plus another couple years where they were flying gliders. And then when they did have a fatality, it was due to an unforeseeable mechanical failure. This would be far from the last time a propeller failure would bring down an airplane. It still happens with modern airplanes and modern metal propellers, although it's now quite rare. So, for the most part, wood props work out just fine in lower power, lower RPM applications, but after World War I, it was clear that something better would be needed. This image is from Taylor's book, Aircraft Propulsion. Feel free to pause and read it if you want, but the gist of it is that developing metal props was not trivial. There were serious issues with vibration and other things that would end in violent destruction. By about 1923, they had developed aluminum propeller blades, and about 10 years later, they had hollow steel propeller blades. By the time World War II is well underway, let's say by 1942 or right around there, nearly all combat propellers are metal. Not all. For example, the 109 Dora 9 famously used a wooden prop, but generally speaking, the hollow steel props were the norm on World War II fighters. So let's get back to propeller pitch. A fixed pitch propeller is always going to be a compromise. In the 1920s, ground adjustable propellers started to show up. These were fairly common throughout the 1930s. A plane so equipped could, while on the ground, have its propeller blade angles adjusted so that they would be optimal for whatever range of flight you plan to use the airplane in, uh, or whatever range of flight was critical for your operation. You know, maybe you operate out of a short strip, so you want to set them to fine pitch, or you do a lot of long haul cross country stuff, in which case you'd want it to be coarse. The point is, it could be adjustable. Such a propeller was famously used on the Spirit of St. Louis, and that was one of the rarely mentioned reasons for Lindbergh's success. The drawback, though, of a constant speed prop is that that adjustment procedure isn't trivial. It's time-consuming, and it must be done with a great deal of precision. Thus, even people that own planes with these types of props pretty rarely mess with the settings. So, it kind of ends up being a bit pointless in a lot of cases, because you could just get a fixed pitch propeller with the blade angle you need. Unless, of course, it's not available for your application, in which case ground adjustable might be your best bet. In other words, you can't find a fixed pitch prop with exactly the pitch you need, so then you go with ground adjustable. Now that's exactly the situation Charles Lindbergh was in, and it's why the spirit of St. Louis was equipped with a ground-adjustable prop for his famous New York to Paris flight, 
I'm stressing that because a lot of people say first across the Atlantic. That's a really vague claim to make. Uh, Lindbergh is famous for the New York to Paris flight. Anyhow, to do that, he needed a coarse enough pitch so the engine would be at or near maximum efficiency during cruise, but just fine enough so that he could take off with that heavy fuel load from his chosen runway. The ground adjustable prop enabled him to set the pitch fine enough so he could take off and still clear the obstacles, barely, but still coarse enough to have the range he needed. I should add that there are now modern aircraft with ground adjustable props, and I have no experience with them, but I've heard that they're easier to, do, to adjust than the stuff in the old days. Um, again, I really don't know much about them, I just want to point out to you that they exist. Now, shortly after Lindbergh's famous New York to Paris flight, two position in-flight adjustable props started to show up, like this one from Hamilton Standard. From the cockpit in flight, you could change the pitch and you would use the low pitch setting for takeoff, uh, climbing or other low speed work. And then you'd switch it over to high pitch for cruise. Now these two position props would be very short lived and they gave way quickly to the variable pitch propeller. Technology was moving fast here. Now that variable pitch propeller would soon give way to the constant speed prop which would be the standard type of propeller in World War II. But let's back up for a minute to that variable pitch prop. When the Supermarine Spitfire entered service in 1938, it was originally pulled along by a two-bladed, fixed-position wooden propeller. Thankfully, that idea didn't last long, and these props were soon replaced by metal, three-bladed variable pitch propellers. Note that these are often called two-position propellers in period literature, but they are not two-position, they are variable, and the pitch can be adjusted to any point between the two extremes. This was just a case of technology advancing faster than terminology. The control for the variable pitch propeller can be seen here at position 9. For takeoff, it's positioned fully aft for fine pitch. Note they're calling it a two-position air screw here in the manual. Once in the air, the pilot will have to move that knob to set the propeller pitch, and as it clearly says here in the same manual, intermediate positions are available. So the pilot can set it right where it needs to be. In practice, though, this causes two problems. First, during the takeoff roll, it's essentially acting as a fixed pitch prop. Because the pilot's too busy at that time to vary the pitch, so thrust isn't going to be maximized. In flight, getting maximum performance out of an engine with this system will require some attention. Anytime the airspeed or manifold pressure changes, adjustments to the prop will have to be made. And that's fine in normal flying, especially when you have a two-pilot crew, but it's not optimal for combat in a single-pilot fighter. In a dogfight, that pilot is going to have to choose between keeping his head down to get maximum performance from the engine or his head up for situational awareness. This drawback, as well as rapidly advancing technology, led to these variable pitch props being replaced pretty quickly by constant speed props. Now these constant speed props started showing up in the mid-1930s, but didn't really become standard on frontline combat fighters until I'd say 1940 to 1941. Newly built Spitfires started coming off the production line with constant speed props a good six or seven months before the Battle of Britain. And most of the older Spitfires were refitted with the new constant speed units, so when it was the Spitfires' time to shine in the battle over England, they had the right type of prop for the job. This also is part of the reason that the Luftwaffe sort of underestimated the Spitfire before the Battle of Britain. It wasn't because the Germans were being arrogant or overconfident. Um, the reason was because they had evaluated some Spitfires that they captured during the Battle of France, and those Spitfires did not have constant speed props and were running on lower octane fuel. The performance of the Supermarine Spitfire increased a lot right before the Battle of Britain. 
Now, this chart does a pretty good job of showing the performance gains that could be expected from a change to a constant speed prop. Of course, the biggest advantage in a fighter is that the pilot will be able to get maximum performance from the engine without having to divert his attention from the fight in order to manage engine RPM. That's an advantage that's tough to quantify, but I think it's pretty easy to understand. Constant speed props, as the name implies, automatically adjust the pitch to hold the propeller and thus engine RPM constant. To make sense of this, I'll pull out our Spitfire Mark II manual, as, for the most part, Mark IIs and laters all have constant speed props. At position 12 in the Mark II's cockpit, we have the air screw, aka propeller control lever. It works in the conventional manner, meaning that forward increases RPM and back decreases RPM, or I guess I should say it's what becomes the conventional manner. Now, if this isn't making sense yet, don't worry, it will. In this specific case, moving the lever all the way back takes the prop out of constant speed mode. That'll cause it to act as a fixed pitch prop in the full course position. Most constant speed props at the time had some sort of position or alternate mode like this uh, in the event of mechanical failure or battle damage. Now, normal use of the constant speed prop is pretty simple. In fact, it's easier to explain how to use it uh, demonstrating it in the airplane than it is talking about it. All of them are more or less operated in the same way. There's usually a pre-takeoff check of the system that's fairly simple, then the prop lever set for takeoff. Now, in most World War II fighters, that means the lever's going to be all the way forward, which will set the prop to run at, depending on the individual airplane, maybe 2,800 to 32 RPM right around there. kind of depends on where the plane makes its uh, takeoff power. Now, at this point in the plane, before the throttle levers advance for takeoff, the RPM is not actually going to increase when you move that prop lever all the way forward because we're outside of the propeller governor range. And the reason for that is because at idle, the engine is only getting enough air and fuel to spin itself at around 800 RPM. So in this case, the prop is already at the minimum fine pitch, and it can't do anything to raise the RPM. So um, that's the reason that at, at, at idle or when you're taxiing around on the ground, you're, you're nowhere near where the prop governor is going to really do anything. However, as power comes up, as you're moving that throttle forward for takeoff, RPM will come up to red line because that's where you have it set. And at that point, the prop pitch will start increasing to increase the load on the motor. And as power goes up and up, pitch goes, increases more and more to hold RPM constant, hence constant speed prop. During climb or cruise, it's normal to pull the manifold pressure back a bit and then reduce RPM, and you do it in that order. The same is true in cruise. So in these conditions, you're setting manifold pressure with the throttle and RPM with the prop lever. And you, the, the order is important. You're generally, when you're pulling power back, you're going to pull the throttle back first and then the RPM lever. And when you're advancing, it's RPM lever first, then the throttle. Now, I'm explaining how this works in typical U.S. and British planes here. German planes are a bit different, and uh, that's going to be in the next video. During flight, the constant speed mechanism will regulate the RPM and hold it at whatever the pilot has set under all but basically two conditions. There are two cases where it won't. First, at lower air speeds, if the throttle is pulled back so far that even minimum pitch can't keep the RPM at the set level, then the RPM is going to drop, just like when you're on the ground, because you're, you're beyond the governor's range at the low pitch side. Second, you can be beyond the governor's range at the high pitch side. This would be unusual, but the way that would happen is, if you're diving at a very high speed, the prop might reach maximum pitch, and then it can't do anything more to keep itself from overspeeding, so the throttle would have to be pulled back. So as with, with most things, constant speed props have a range of operation. That range is determined by the pitch limits, power settings, and air speeds. But for practical purposes, the range incorporates, or encompasses, I should say, all normal flight. So, how does this miracle device work? Well, there are several types. All use some form of power to change the blade angle, thus pitch, 
It's usually either going to be hydraulics, electric, sometimes there are springs in there or counterweights. Um, some airplanes use pressurized cylinders and sometimes centrifugal forces are involved. On US aircraft, constant speed props were usually one of three types. The first I'll mention is the Curtis electric prop. Curtis made electrically controlled props that were used on the P-51A, the P-38 Lightning, the P-40, the P-47 Thunderbolt, F-4F Wildcat, and a lot more. A lot of airplanes ran Curtis Electric. Hamilton Standard was another company. They made hydraulically controlled propellers. Those were used on Corsairs, P-51 B, C, and D models, Hellcats, some P-47 Thunderbolts, and, uh, and more. They were fairly common too. The third type was another hydraulically controlled type. So there are two hydraulic types, two primary ones anyway. And this one's made by Aero Products. These could be found on the P-39 Aero Cobras, at least on the Q models. They were found on the P-63 King Cobra and the P-51K. The 51K is essentially identical to the D model except that it has the Aero Products propeller instead of the Hamilton Standard prop. They were a little bit different. The Hamilton Standard prop on the D-Model P-51 had a greater range of blade angles, 42 degrees versus only 35 degrees for the Aero Products prop. So the United States used both electric and hydraulic props, and both types were used by the U.S. Navy. Both types were used by the U.S. Army Air Force, and both were used on air-cooled radials, and both were used on liquid-cooled V-12s. So it would be tough to argue which type of mechanism was favored and why. They were both commonly used, and both worked very well. I will say that I personally would have preferred hydraulic control. If I was going to be flying a plane in World War II, I would have rather had a hydraulic prop. And the reason is that with an electric prop, if you lose your generator, and that was not uncommon back then, or worse, if you're in a twin-engine airplane with only one generator, in other, in other words, only one engine drives a generator, for example, an early P-38 Lightning, and you lose that engine that drives your one and only generator, your life just got very complicated. You are now reliant on that battery for propeller uh, control. And batteries back then, once the generator was out, didn't last very long. So if this happens to you in an early P-38 or maybe something similar, the procedure involves switching the props out of automatic control into fixed pitch. You then shut off the battery, which of course means you lose all electrical power. So hopefully you're not flying at night. Hopefully you don't need the radios or instrument lights or whatever. At that point, you fly along with the props in fixed pitch until you really need to make a pitch change. Then you turn on the battery and use the manual adjustment. Electric props used a lot of electrical power. In fact, in World War II airplanes, often the first sign of a generator failure was the constant speed prop uh, no longer holding RPM. In other words, you're flying along and you notice your, RP your engine RPM uh, starts moving around and, oh, hey, the generator light's on. Now, I don't want to cover each type in depth, and I don't really think we need to, but let's take a look at the mechanism in the Hamilton Standard Hydraulic Prop to get a general idea about how these things work. There are, of course, variations from uh, one system and one, even one plane to another. Now, this looks complicated, and it is. Constant speed props have a lot going on to make the magic happen, but We'll go through the basics, and once you understand the basics, if you want to really dig deeply into this, you'll find it much easier to understand. Um, once you see how this works, it all just kind of starts to make sense. So starting off with this picture, I only need you to notice three things, so that's not so bad. First, notice that there is no way anybody is going to fire a cannon through the prop shaft of something with a Hamilton Standard hydromatic propeller. Anytime you see a plane that can fire a weapon through the prop shaft, it's using a very different design, and we'll get to that. Next, I want you to notice the location of the governor. It's important. This thing spins in proportion to engine speed, and thus, as its name implies, is the key component in regulating propeller and thus engine speed. It's what keeps the engine speed constant. 
without the governor, um, with just some sort of manual way to do this, then you would have a variable pitch propeller. So the governor is, in a sense, what makes this system a constant speed prop system. Last, I want you to notice these two little parts of the governor, which are called flyweights. These are really, they make the magic happen. As this thing spins, centrifugal force moves these things outboard. The faster the engine spins, the farther out they go. In this picture, they're all the way in. So we know this engine is running at low RPM. This governor position is called under speed. That means the RPM is below that selected by the prop lever in the cockpit. For example, this is where it would be just before you advanced the uh, throttle for takeoff. In other words, the prop lever is all the way forward for max RPM, but the engine's at idle. The engine could actually be shut off in this case. We don't know. What we do know is it's under speed. The prop lever in the cockpit does less than you might think. All it's doing is changing the spring tension in that governor, and that's going to make more sense as we go along. This is uh, the pilot manual for the Douglas A26 Invader, and this is a simplified diagram from it, and it's a diagram that is going to work well for our purposes. I'm sure you can find the governor on your own, but notice that near the governor, we have these two gears. They comprise a secondary oil pump that raises oil pressure above that which is provided by the engine's oil pump. Now, I've circled this black line at the point where it branches off. That black line represents engine oil coming from the engine oil pump. Same oil the engine uses for lubrication and cooling. It, or, well, cooling in the case of an air-cooled engine. It takes one of two main paths. Note that this is a hugely simplified diagram. The actual diagram for this thing looks like the circulatory system for a small, small, for a small mammal, which is to say it's highly complex. But for our discussion, this diagram is just great. So that engine oil is going to go to the high pressure pump, and it's going to go from the engine driven pump to the dome at the front of the propeller hub at position two. Speaking of that dome, that's what you see here on this P-47's propeller. This one has a Hamilton Standard hydraulic prop. We can tell because it has a short squat dome. Here's a P-47 with the Curtis electric prop, which has the long skinny dome. In pictures, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference, especially depending on the angle and stuff, but up close in real life, the difference is very apparent. Now, Back to our diagram. There are three forces involved in changing the blade angle, two of which are controlled by the governor. The first is engine oil pressure, which drives the prop towards low pitch. The second is boosted oil pressure, which drives the prop towards high pitch. And the third is the aerodynamic load on the propeller blade, which drives it towards low pitch. So if the whole hydraulic portion of the mechanism fails for some reason, the prop, clip, the prop blades aren't going to just flop around. They'll go to low pitch. Here's how it works. If a lower pitch is needed to maintain engine RPM, for example, we've entered a climb and from cruise and the airplane is starting to slow down, the governor will present, correction, will prevent the boosted oil from going anywhere. Oil from the engine's oil pump, though, will still be able to go into the front of the dome on the right side of the picture at location two. This is going to shove that piston back. That piston is connected to a rolling pin here. The rolling pin moves in a cam slot, and when it goes back, it forces that bevel gear to move counterclockwise as viewed from the front, which drives the prop towards low pitch. So if you just pause and think about that a little bit, it'll probably make sense. Now, knowing that, you can probably guess how the system's going to move it towards high pitch. The governor allows the high pressure oil from the secondary pump to go through the line and push on the other side of the piston, thus moving the prop to high pitch. And because that's the higher uh, pressure oil, anytime the governor allows that oil to, to access to the back side of that thing, that's the way it's going to go. Now, not all hydraulic props work in this same way but they are all the same in principle. 
However, be aware that some use engine oil pressure to drive the prop towards high pitch. So some work backwards of this one. And also, some use oil pressure only on one side of the piston and have a strong spring and or um, something charged with gas, like typically nitrogen pressure, providing the opposing force. In this case, this system uses oil pressure on both sides of the piston, but it, it can be done a number of ways and is done a number of ways. So how does that governor work? Well, this is really simple. Well, kind of. Remember those flyweights we talked about? Well, when they move due to centrifugal force, whether out or in, they move this shaft and they move it up and down. The movement of the shaft uncovers or blocks different ports that either allow or prevent the boosted oil from going to or from the prop hub, the back side of the prop hub. So when you move your prop lever forward to increase RPM, what you're actually doing is increasing the spring tension, which in this case causes the flyweights to move inboard, which positions the governor to prevent boosted oil from going to the piston and oil from the back side of the piston. It allows that oil to escape so that engine oil pressure can then force the piston back with nothing to stop it. As it drives the prop to lower pitch, as the RPM increases, the flyweights, of course, start to move outboard due to centrifugal force. And when the engine RPM reaches the level set by the pilot, the flyweights will have moved to a position so the shaft um, moves in such a way that return oil from the back side of the piston is blocked and the blade angles stay put. If the prop then selects a lower RPM, thus higher pitch, the flywheels, the flyweights rather, move outboard, and the high pressure oil is allowed to push on the back side of the piston until the selected RPM level is reached. So if you have to listen to that again or just pause and stare at the diagram, I, I, I think that uh, that's enough to make sense, generally speaking, of how constant speed props work, and they're all very similar to this. The Curtis electric prop uh, works in much the same way. It's just that instead of a hydraulically actuated piston, there's an electric motor housed in the spinner, and it spins gears to change, to actuate the bevel gears to change the pitch. The governor is very similar as well. It also uses the spring tension and flyweight system. The prop lever in the cockpit varies the spring tension. That's the same. The big difference, of course, is that the Curtis in the Curtis prop, the flyweights control electrical signals because, of course, it's an electric prop. Now, notice, of course, you won't be firing a cannon through the hub of this Curtis Electric either. Of course, the U.S. built the P-39 Era Cobra, and it did have a cannon firing through the prop hub. At least some of these had another version of the Curtis Electric prop, but I think they're very rare and I have not been able to, to find a single picture or diagram of that mechanism. Most P-39s, as well as the P-63 King Cobra, used Aero Products hydraulic propellers. Aero Products was a division, uh, well, it was the propeller division of General Motors. It wasn't hugely successful, as only a relatively small number of planes used these. During World War II, something like 3% of all U.S.-built aircraft had Aero Products propellers, although I suppose that in terms of total numbers, that's still a lot of airplanes, certainly by modern standards. So that brings us all the way up to about 1942, and that's where I'm going to end this video. In the next video, we're going to cover the German prop system and talk about the three versus four blade propeller issues. If you're watching this video right when it became public, um, be aware that that next video is already up for the Patreon viewers and should be for, the, for everybody else very soon. As always, I want to thank my subscribers and especially my supporters on Patreon who got early access to this video and others. Please check out my Teespring store. We have mugs, posters, and more. It's a really great way to help support the channel and I do appreciate it. Goodbye for now and have a great day.